cool room in front of us, and I'm very happy to see so many of you here and, and Bini as well attending our public discussion online. So thank you so much. Uh, and I'm very happy to uh, be the moderator of, of this discussion. I will be uh, introducing uh, uh, our fantastic panelists uh, in a couple of minutes. Before that, I would like to give a couple of words to first of all introduce uh, our organization uh, uh, that is the coordinator of this uh, fantastic project that we have uh, ahead of us, the Digital for Sustainability Project. Uh, and I'm here, uh, Antonio De Asso, uh, Public Affairs Director at the European Digital Economy Alliance. Uh, indeed representing the organization that uh, we have the honor to coordinate uh, this project. And I'm honored indeed to kick off this discussion about the skills that are needed for the digital and green transition. Uh, why this is so important? Well, many of you already know that with this project, we wanna provide an impact on shaping the uh, digital and, and green transition uh, in this decade, because this is the decisive de decade that we have ahead of us, uh, that we are ready in, and uh, that indeed will be determinant in order to meet the ambitious goal of the European Green Deal and uh, lead the way towards the uh, the, the, the goal that uh, uh, want to achieve climate neutrality in Europe. Why digital and green transition? Well, the digital technologies clearly can make a decisive impact as well in uh, streamlining the transition in the right direction. And uh, they can do so by contributing to reducing uh, emissions uh, and by uh, increasing the sustainability of every in industrial sector. So by now there is no doubt that the green and the digital transition are intrinsically linked and they can be mutually beneficial to each other. That is why we think this discussion about the skills that are needed in the European workforce to drive the twin transition is fundamental. Uh, and it is fundamental because Europe, at the European Digital Assembly Alliance, we know dealing with our members who are innovative SME uh, uh, entrepreneurs uh, in Europe, uh, that uh, on the everyday job of a digital SME entrepreneur, there is the challenge to find the right skill and the right people to cope with a twin transition that will usually transform and shape the labor market in Europe. And uh, we also know that uh, those innovative uh, leaders, those innovative entrepreneurs can be in the position as well to drive the upskilling and the skilling of the workforce, to drive the uptake of those skills that will serve to the European industrial ecosystem overall, to maintain industrial leadership at, at global level, and to drive the industrial ecosystem toward the objective of the digital and the dream and the dream transition. So I'm, I'm very happy to uh, indeed uh, kick off this discussion because uh, the race to achieve climate neutrality will significantly reshape the European labor market. And to maintain a, a, a leading position in this, we need to maximize the synergies between the green and the digital transition. It is because of that that the digital for sustainability project can bring a significant contribution to this. I mentioned before in, in our uh, uh, opportunity to uh, uh, that we have got to get to know uh, before this discussion the, the construction project that I cannot name all of them simply because they uh, are so many. This construction brings together 24 construction partners and uh, five associate partners. And they are all the stakeholders that can bring a significant contribution to uh, leading the digital and, and the transition. So I think we are in the perfect place to have a discussion on the right skills uh, to, to drive this. Bit. And therefore, without further ado, I would like to uh, start introducing our uh, panelists. 
we have online uh, pan-technical head of skills analysis at, at, at the OCB Center for Skills. We have here, we have seen uh, frame uh, that is principal economies as this is go at the European Commission. Uh, back online, we have uh, Ilya Piatovidis, a writer for digital aspect of the green transformation at DC Connect at the European Commission. And last but not least, uh, we have Deborah Dole, coordinator for the digital for sustainability project, and my colleague at the European Digital Assembly Alliance, a senior uh, project manager. So thank you all for being here today. And I would like to start with you, Deborah so that you can uh, help us to dive in the project and explain what uh, would be the, the, the main goal of, of this project. Thank you very much, uh, Antonio, and I'm very glad here to, to speak here as the coordinator of the project, and I'm very proud also to be the coordinator of such a uh, project, which is, uh, which is bringing together 29 partners, food and associated partners from, uh, from 14 different EU countries, and all are uh, coming from industry, education, and from sustainability. So we have uh, in the consortium, we have ICT associations of companies of all sizes, we have chambers of commerce, we have clusters, we have uh, universities, vocational and educational training providers, um, as well as experts, and they are all united in this consortium to boost skills for the green and uh, data transition. So, I want to give a bit of a background about also the consortium, which is stemming from the large scale partnership uh, of the digital ecosystem and the, the Pact for Skills. So um, it's an initiative which has been like kickstarted uh, from one of the members of the Pact for Skills, which is Cape Island, who has proposed this idea to create uh, a new consortium and address this very, uh, very um, important um, topic of skills for the green and data transition. So um, the Pact for Skills um, and the Digital Large, large Scale Partnership is one of the 15 industrial ecosystems of the, uh, of the Pact for Skills, and it aims uh, to upskill uh, and reskill the European workforce and to achieve the uh, climate, uh, the, um, the digital uh, decade, decade targets of uh, reskilling 80% or equipping 80% of the uh, workforce with a basic digital skills by 2030 and to support Europe's greens and digital transition. And this is really what is driving uh, the, the consortium is um, that all partners in this consortium and in the digital last partnership under the Pact of Skills have acknowledged the role uh, of sustainable innovation in achieving climate neutrality, as well as the need for the ICT sector to become greener. greener. So there are several challenges that we want to address with this project. Um, the first challenge is to make our own paths cleaner. So by providing uh, the current and future workforce of the ICT sector with knowledge, skills, attitudes, be able to increase the carbon footprint of the ICT sector. Um, the second challenge is to have a workforce which is capable of developing technologies that can support Europe's sensible uh, objectives by reducing CO2 emissions. And then another sad challenge is also to have a workforce which is capable of deploying, using, and interacting um, with these technologies, such as to ensure that they have a positive impact on the climate. So there are a lot of challenges, and we will try to address all these challenges to some extent. And this is also the reason for today's discussion and the two days meeting with all the consortium partners is to we discuss how we want to approach all these challenges and how we want to scope the product to be able to address uh, the needs, uh, current needs of, of the labor market. And it's indeed a very uh, ambitious goal. And for this, uh, we will have four years uh, to achieve uh, the, to achieve our goals with, with the project. So it's a long term project. And uh, we also, as I have said, have a very good consortium, which is industry driven. So it's an initiative coming from the digital sector. And uh, so we, we know what are the, the labor market needs, the needs of the sector. And we also have uh, training experts and universities which really recognize the need of having trainings which align, align with the real uh, labor market needs, and as well as with uh, the policy needs. So the third year of the project, we will focus on skills intelligence. So we will see what is the current state of play 
what are jobs and occupations which are emerging in the sector, uh, what uh, are things needed by these different jobs and occupations, and um, what are already frameworks which are already, already there, so we don't duplicate other efforts. So this may be a big effort to have a, a good overview of, of the market labor, the like labor market needs. And um, at the end of the first year, the project will already have uh, developed some trainings, which we will call urgent skills uh, needs training, um, which will be suitable for any person already in the workforce, or already employed, so short, short time trainings, modular trainings, uh, which can be taken online also at own paces. So the, the idea of the project is really to provide trainings which fit uh, workforce and keep everybody in employment and that they can also take just short training or you can have one certain skill or one certain competence. So if, for instance, if you are an AI developer, you just want to know more about uh, machine learning, how to make it more energy efficient, you can take one training and not need to go back uh, for five years to, to university. So this is a bit the, the approach of the project to have uh, these uh, modular trainings and uh, micro -trainings. So This is the, the um, innovative approach we will be taking. Sounds exciting. So thank you very much for this detailed uh, presentation, Deborah. Now, I would also like to stimulate from uh, the other panelists their views on, on the scope of, of this project and if they, if they think it's fit to address the challenges and opportunities that uh, unfold from the twin transition. And I would like to start going online to Ilias uh, to ask him indeed his uh, reaction on, on on the project overall, and then also to enlighten us on why, in your point of view, it's important to look at skills and competencies uh, when speaking about the digital and the same transition. Ilya, so over to you. Thank you. So good afternoon. It's very impressive, the list. I mean, I, I assume they are not all partners of your project, huh? the ones that are attending. So that means that there is a lot of attraction to the topic. Uh, let me give you two words what we do, what we consider to be green digital twin transition, because there is a lot of misunderstanding that these two transitions are important. Those are the top two transitions that are for this commission, but it's really about their in Lexus. Huh? So what do they do together? And what do they do together? What people normally think of, what majority of people think when they think of green and digital is how polluting is digital, you know, how bad. Uh, it is in terms of energy consumption, which is like close to eight to nine percent of total electricity goes to the digital world. How polluting it is in terms of materials, because it's the fastest growing category of waste. And how polluting is also in, in terms of water and natural resources and rare metals and all that stuff. So depending if you look at that aspect and Deborah already mentioned that there is a need for the digitally skilled people that develop devices, software, hardware, IoT sensors, uh, digital solutions for energy buildings, agriculture, to start thinking that there are ways that they can, you know, there are ways that where they can improve the energy and material efficiency of what they are developing. So this is very particular skill, and I will not drill on this, but be aware that there are needs for digital, digitally trained people to start thinking about energy and materials and what is the frugality of, do I really need to copy all this data in 17 different places? Can I kind of do some you know, savings in terms of energy and uh, pollution when it comes to digital? So that's one category of skills. The other category of skills that is more important, I guess that's where you're going to put more emphasis, is how do we deploy digitalization in the climate critical sectors such as energy transport, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, smart cities, healthcare even, which is also a very polluting sector. So how do I develop skills to people to be able to recognize the fit for purpose digitalization that will drive my sustainability goals wherever I am, whatever job I do in the other fields than digital. There I have 
one slide only if I can display just to give you how tragic the situation is. So I will try to share with you just one slide, just one picture. That's it. Um, just to show you. Um, it's kind of taking a bit of time. I don't know if you see it by now. It's it's working. And I'm sure. Yeah. So uh, maybe it's not in a display mode. So I will just try to do that. You can, you can see it clear. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I so when it comes to yes, let's apply digitalization to avoid emissions, to improve biodiversity, or to you know help pollution. We have no skills and we have no people to do it. 60% of companies don't have the people. 60% of local municipalities don't have people because they receive money. So there is a lot of money going down. And if you think of the recovery resilience plans, only those which that's only one of many funding streams that are now going to the local level saying, now develop green transition policy and implement it. Now, and by the way, this is the digital money, implement the digital money for infrastructure solutions, whatever. People do not understand how to spend the money and how to marry, how to create a synergy between the two. And that's local level, and that's both administrations and companies. So we need to develop two, three things, I would say three things. First, when in the digital world, we need to create this awareness of deploy and create markets of digitalization in the green fields, the sectors I mentioned. It's not yet there. When I talk to big companies, they have not yet seen the opportunity of the greening and the green transition as a development market to deploy skills and deploy an investment in that directions. When it comes to the, all the green constituencies, the environmentalists, the public offices, the NGOs, they are also need they need to understand a little bit how digitalization works and what is the fit for purpose digitalization because they still live in 20th century excel sheets data kind of basic data management which can be done much better you can see it in the laws in the measures and directives and regulations that the environmentalists are publishing there is a very thin there is no digitalization by design in those regulations, how to manage the data, how do I monitor, how do I enforce, how do I create policy based on this data. So it's still lacking the skills on the green side. And then we need a third category of people, and those are the people that are the marriage brokers, that actually understand those two roles, because it's difficult that you get environmentalists to be PhD in AI. And it's difficult the AI to understand what LCA means and what environmental engineering means. They will kind of do half ways, but we need the people in the middle to bring these things together. So those type of three skills is what we need. And now the last thing is that you can either focus to create curricula for universities and good luck to change any university course in these three directions. I tried that in healthcare and it's kind of impossible to even change so that is a change that will come up and you will see it in 15 years from now. Or you do just in time on the job training of the people that need to do a green public procurement or the people that are now suddenly in charge of smart city applications. And you try to create a support services to these people just in time on the job. And that is much more challenging. And what you can do because you will not be able to outreach as a project, you need to create those people network of those people that can do it locally. So that is how I see, without reading your technical annex, I mean, your work program and deliverables, uh, a big need, okay, that you may hopefully do a contribution there. Thank you. Streamlining already our discussion in a quite interesting way because we have indeed heard from you, you consider that basically there are three main uh, categories of, of skills that will be needed. The, the ones that are needed to raise awareness in the entrepreneurship, uh, the one to uh, raise uh, the fit for purpose, uh, let's say, digitalization of our disaster ecosystems, and the ones that can be raised as well in the just, we are just in time uh, training. So I, I think these are 
very interesting inputs that we got uh, already in the beginning of our discussion. And I am curious to hear from Francesca, who has been leading at the OECD, a very interesting effort on the skills for the uh, resilient green and digital transition. If some of these insights that Elias just shared are also coming out of, of your record, and whether indeed you could give us uh, a perspective on the on the main result of this report and also on how uh, the EU environmental goals and policies may affect uh, the labor market, uh, including uh, the occupation and the demand for the right skills. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think a lot of the insights we have uh, are quite complementary uh, to the insights that Elias uh, just uh, uh, just mentioned. Uh, in particular, in the context of the skills outlook with respect uh, to the uh, labour market aspect uh, for Europe, what we did was we analysed the impact of the Feed for 55 policy package, uh, which aims to uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 55% uh, by 2030 compared to 1990 levels. Uh, this is a critical initiative, uh, but it requires a system level change uh, in terms of uh, uh, structural organization of the economy. And so a lot of the results we find um, pertain to the fact that, that some of the sectors that will change the most in relative terms, uh, the green and the brown jobs, the renewables and fossil fuel extraction, um, actually employ few people in the economy. Uh, by contrast, uh, the sectors that employ a lot of people and that are in fact most exposed uh, to productivity gains that pertain to digitalization, for example, such as business services and public services, uh, um, will also require changes as a result uh, of the Fit for 55 package, but have um, uh, uh, let's say, less dramatic relative changes and so are often forgotten by uh, policy discussions in terms of uh, 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 skills policies resulting from uh, the green transition. So our findings, our projections show that ambitious uh, um, targets, green targets, uh, uh, such as those uh, uh, that fall under the Fit for 55 package, uh, uh, can be achieved with minimal uh, effects of, on overall employment. And in fact, uh, uh, our projections indicate uh, a small increase. And in large part, uh, this is because of uh, digital adoption uh, in, in the economy. Um, at the same time, the energy sector uh, will be starkly reshaped. Uh, employment, for example, is projected to grow by as much as 78% in renewables uh, and nuclear electricity, but decrease by over similar amounts uh, in fossil fuel-based uh, energy sectors. Uh, at the same time, these sectors uh, account for less than 1% uh, of total employment in the EU. By contrast, what I said before, in terms of what happens to business services and other services, we have small relative changes, uh, an increase of 2% or 3% respectively by 2030. But these sectors employ essentially 80 million workers uh, uh, in Europe. And so in, a, in, in terms of skills policies, uh, if we want uh, uh, to make sure that we have uh, the right talent for sectors that in absolute terms, uh, as well as relative terms, uh, uh, will increase, uh, uh, we need to invest a lot uh, in uh, at the intersection between uh, green and digital, but also uh, the digital aspect uh, more specifically. In particular, uh, what we see is that uh, both uh, in terms of job profiles, but also tasks uh, that will become more important uh, in the future, uh, there will be a big need uh, for skills that are ancillary, I would say, to what digital can do. So working alongside people, communicating with others. Uh, one transition that is often forgotten is the demographic transition. So assisting and caring for others will become increasingly important. Um, 
The other set of skills that will grow in importance because they are extremely prevalent in the service industries are working alongside technology, so software development, uh, analyzing data and information. Uh, and finally, there is a set of skills that are needed across occupation and industries, such as uh, dependability, achievement, problem solving, making decisions, and etc. And so, one uh, crucial challenge I think for for policymakers is is to develop the set of uh, uh, general skills that will be needed across the board, but then also uh, promote participation in adult learning, particularly to facilitate transitions, keeping in mind that the geographical distribution of winners and losers, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, is not the same. And so some of the sectors that will be contracting are not necessarily in the same regions as those that will be expanding. And also in terms of distribution of uh, prior educational attainment, which is also a predictor for participation in adult learning, uh, is not the same. Again, some of the uh, uh, the, 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 the groups that will be most affected are individuals with low levels of formal education and low uh, habit of participating in, uh, in adult learning. And finally, uh, just because it's something that I care quite deeply about, uh, is the gender dimension of, uh, of the transition. Many of the profiles, again, that are expected to shrink most considerably, if you think about uh, um, uh, mining in Poland, for example, uh, but also to expand most significantly uh, are predominantly so far uh, male uh, um, uh, with an over representation of, of males. Insights from, from the OECD reports, I think they bring additional elements that uh, can help us streamline the discussion and also maybe I lied to what can be the major contribution that the digital for sustainability project can bring, taking into account this trend. And indeed, when it comes uh, to the impact on, on several industrial sectors, Francesca, you mentioned uh, uh, a kind of good news, right, if I, if I can call it like that, that there will be, at the end of the day, a minimal impact uh, on uh, on the several industrial sector also because of, of digitalization and therefore i'm going to you assume that uh a digital is leading uh, a number of concrete and actionable actionable plans to drive the digital transformation of all the industrial ecosystems in europe and and these plans are the transition pathways could you tell us what the role of the skill of the skill set play within uh, the transition pathways and how they can help us to uh, lead the way to digital transformation of your journey. Certainly, I will do so. And um, first of all, thank you very much for all of you to be here and to have kickstarted this uh, exciting project. I'm particularly happy that the University of Koblenz is here in my hometown. So um, where your campus is, I played football. So I hope that you make good use of the territory that you have uh, conquered there. Yeah. Um, it's a very fascinating topic and actually a very good outcome of the large scale partnership on skills that we uh, created that I uh, initialized uh, not so long ago and where we have the, digital, the European Digital SME Alliance as a very strong partner also in this project here. Because I think we need to take the step from the Sunday speeches to the concrete one. And that is probably my starting observation when you talk about the transition cross space. Very briefly on the transition cross space. Now, the Commission some while ago, as part of its industrial policy, has uh, defined 14 industrial ecosystems, deviating from our previous approach where we talked about sectors and industries. Now we talk more about the integration of activities in broader ecosystems. So we defined these 14 ecosystems. And for each of these ecosystems, uh, we are working on what we call a transition pathway, moving towards what the colleagues have explained, the twin digital and green transition, where the skills dimension is one building block, as we call it, to fill this with slides. We have already published on the respective website a number of um, these transition pathways, for example, for mobility, for other ecosystems, some others will follow in the next uh, couple of months. And certainly the skills perspective is very important uh, there, but when you read the 
uh, documents on the transition pathways, it stays relatively generic. So the issues come together very often in the same way. It's still at a relatively high level. There's a certain shortage of skills. There's a certain shortage of uh, education providers. There is the need to, at the same time, be broad and narrow on the breakthrough technologies and stuff like that. That is essentially the same. What I would now say to be more concrete here is that when we started our large scale partnership under the Pact for Skills, we said that we need to be completely inclusive, especially with regards to 25 million SMEs that we have in Europe. 99% of our companies are SMEs. They don't have the time, they don't have the resources, they don't have the interest, perhaps very often, to be either digital or green or both because they're occupied in the daily business. So they need intermediaries to work together with them. And most of our companies, uh, and that includes actually also myself as governing this, are not considering themselves as digital. Some of them are, but most of them are saying, okay, well, digital, we can use it or not, but uh, not perhaps a priority. On green, the same. I'm certainly not a green person. Many entrepreneurs are not a green person, but it doesn't matter what your opinion is. It doesn't matter what your preference is. What we try to explain to them is that if you live in today's society, we have to have a number of digital and green skills uh, that applies to everyone. And I take three examples for digital and the same applies for green. If you're working in whatever environment, you need to know about data. The general data protection regulation, whether you like it or not, is the foundation of everything that we do in the digital domain. And data management is of importance to you. It becomes very costly if you do not pay respect to that. The second part is cybersecurity. We all know the issues wherever you work as regards to resilience. And I can tell you that even at the European Commission, there's 50,000 people where we have an excellent cybersecurity training. And these 10%, recently 50% of our colleagues fail when we do a little exercise as regards to who clicks the button. Yes, they all the button. So it is definitely an issue. Uh, the third thing is how you deal with the crowd, because a crowd in the digital domain is something completely different than a crowd in an analog domain, because a digital crowd doesn't have time. A digital crowd wishes to interact. There is much more speed into it. And actually, the thing about digitalization is speed of innovation. That's the thing that has changed. The same is on me. Whether you regard yourself as we or not, there is an impact on resources. There is a request from society to deal with these issues. So the question is, how do you actually deal with these points? So that analysis is not new. But what is important is to come together in joint spaces where you can actually have a combination of the two things, the basic knowledge, but also the insight into the very fast advancing innovation both on the digital and green domain and then combine them meaningfully. And unfortunately, when we talk about the opportunities that the colleague from Digital Connect very correctly mentioned, we still see, including in our house, and especially in our house, uh, far too often that people just don't understand the issues. For example, when you talk about decentralization and tokenization, when you talk about crypto assets, Bitcoin as the key leading example, the main discussion is about energy discussion on group of work. So there is a fundamental misunderstanding of how the alluded to that, how polluting or not that is, completely disregarding the massive changes that we have seen over the last two, three years, because the speed of innovation there is massive. Same applies to other things, artificial intelligence, the quantum computing, where people are telling us that perhaps in 10 years all our encryption might be obsolete because quantum computing breaks that open. That's absolutely not true because the solutions are there. But these are typical issues where you need to have the insights from the two domains. And there is something now where I see a very big role actually for you to play, because in all the transition pathways, in all the documents that we have so far, we are at a relatively high level, but we do not meet the demand that is on the market. And what makes the digital ecosystem special, but also the green dimension special, is that on the one hand side, we have an ecosystem here when you train your own people wherever you are in these technologies but at the same time you need to meet a demand from all other certain ecosystems because you can work on textiles you can work on tourism you can work where you want digital and green are essential parts of the skill set of these people that as i said do not have time that as i said do not know what is out there and this is where it's not so much about your organization as such as to what you actually offer in, in terms of modular building blocks that people can adapt to their needs. And there I give you a last example for this first round before I stop. 
I studied economics 35 years ago. I now spend one day per week with my son at his Dutch university. So he started studying economics, surprisingly. So uh, I'm now, after 35 years, revisiting my microeconomics and macroeconomics courses, just sitting in the lectures and just uh, uh, upscaled myself. Fascinating to see that 90% of the substance is absolutely identical to what I learned 35 years ago, but the complete setup, the complete tool set is fundamentally different. It shocked me at first that people are now at the university when they have two hours of lecture per week and the rest of the time they do what they have to do themselves, co-organizing themselves, using digital means, using MOOCs, having all sorts of platforms, having peer learning among themselves in very small groups, a complete different set of organizations where they have many more granular blocks that they then apply much less in a theoretical context, but in a concrete case context. What is my case? What is the problem I have to solve? What is the issue that I really wish to have the answer to in six weeks from now, because then I will be graded? That is the realistic question that you will meet in your working life all over your life. It's not about having a fun time five months and then there is an exam or God, but it is on a daily basis to have the next level discussion on these things. And this is what I would expect also for you to look into in the next four years to give us the very complete solutions because you have so many more technical opportunities now, but while you have the big demand, you need to leave it, in my opinion, to everyone out there to define their own needs and be the consumers that basically link them to you in order to get the answers from you on how to do that. And if you can manage that, then I would say that's a unique characteristic where you have put a major step forward compared to what we now have on very generic documents. Thank you, Joachim. I even personally relate to the challenge of the economics nowadays. Uh, <laughs> for the of as well. Being uh, in need to even learn programming and so on. So while I was there, I decided to deal with digital policy instead of <laughs> learning broadly. Uh, so I'm going back to Sudamora because uh, I would like to know how also uh, digital SMEs can respond and help to meet uh, these challenges. And uh, when it comes to the project, as uh, project coordinator, how we can help the project going into the action of responding to the overall EU skills ecosystem and possibly support as well the efforts within the passport skills. Thank you. Yes. Uh, well, first, I would like to thank you, the speakers, for uh, giving very interesting uh, insights for the project on, on the skills which are issues so versus communications, uh, transversal skills, which uh, is which we believe in, or even the, the fact to have uh, to have skills or to inform green people about digital. It's, uh, it's perhaps not that obvious for people from the industry who think it's not that about informing digital people about green skills, but the way the other way around is it. It's good also to, to look at the broader uh, picture. Um, and how we want to work together with the, how we fit into the EU skills ecosystem, it's indeed a very challenging question because in, in the EU there are a lot of skills initiatives. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a very demanded topic. Um, so, what we do as a consortium is that since we come from the North African boundary from the digital ecosystem, we work also together with the other ecosystems uh, on how we can also uh, be able to transfer digital skills into the other sectors. So I know, for instance, that there is another um, ecosystem uh, from the automotive sector which has started a new project on green and digital skills for mobility. And this is also something we will be uh, working together with them to make sure that also the other ecosystems uh, benefit uh, also from from the from the training in, um, um, and another point I wanted to mention is that the consortium we have is also working a lot in skills for other digital uh, verticals. So we have partners working in AI skills, partner working on cybersecurity skills, uh, blockchain skills. Uh, software skills, so everything is already covered to some extent, and I know that these programs also cover to some extent sustainability practices. So now the aim is to, with this upscale workforce we have in all these different digital topics, verticals, is to make sure that they also have the, the sustainability knowledge that, that they will be able to, to develop and to move forward the, the green energy transition. Thank you, Deborah. So be also concise, and I would like to invite uh, the other speakers as well to follow your example because we would like to open uh, the discussion for Q and A 
uh, very shortly. So I'm going back online to ask as well to uh, Elias. Uh, uh, you already mentioned before that you consider that just in time and, and on the job training could be one challenging way, but could be the way to you know, make sure that the right skills are spread over the workforce. How do you feel as well the role of education and training uh, in this? Uh, and uh, also, how can these trainings be tailored in a way that drives the digital uh, uptake, uh, the uptake of digital technologies uh, over the different ecosystems? Thank you. So I want to thank Francesca for laying the ground on what I wanted to say now. So it's perfect. And Joachim as well. And so the Amarillis team is actually doing a very good job in digitizing the industry, kind of trying to, to get there. So let me first say that two mega trends, digital transformation and the green transition, those are the two mega trends, uh, are I working in isolation. So at this while this is a priority of the commission for the five years, those two mega trends have barely touched. The synergy of the two we have not been realized yet. So we need much more effort to marry those two. I think if we if I had to choose, okay, do I focus on how many engineers, well, how many skilled workers I need to put all the chargers on the streets? And I can give you some numbers. And DG employment has a lot of numbers as well, and DG energy as well. How many people do we need to put all the solar panels and all the chargers on the street? It's well studied and the needs for this type of workers are done. I would raise something that is less talked about, and that goes down to Francesca's points. Where is the biggest employment happening? In the services, in the SMEs. What is the biggest green thing SMEs can do? Is to help the transition to circular economy. What is a circular economy? Circular economy is the solution to climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution. Those are the triple crises that define the green transition. The driver of this triple crisis is not that we burn oil, it's the non-circularity of our economy. So if we really want to address the green transition mega trend correctly, we need to go down and see where is the biggest thing, how we run the economy. Who is the economy? Well, it's this mostly SMEs. What do they need to go to become more circular? Well, they need to become, they have to adopt circular business models. They have no clue what that means. I'll give you one example. How if I'm in the production, if I sell something as a product, a circular business model example is to, instead of selling products, and that means I make money by selling quantities of material, to go into a product as a service. For that, I need to digitize my business completely. How do I digitize my business if I don't even understand anything of that? I need to have a specialized support. And OK, we tried the coaches and did you grow? Joachim will tell you all about, you know, coaching SMEs and all that stuff. We need to create conditions locally where they will understand that they can do very profitable business by not selling natural resources, but by selling services that address people's needs. That big paradigm shift at scale needs a lot of digitalization and a lot of skills, a lot of understanding that, yes, I can be sustainable and get my scope one, scope two, three, which SMEs don't need to care about yet. But I can be sustainable by becoming, you know, have a sustainable and circular business model that is enabled by digitalization. Because in order for me to do that, I need to know where my products are, I need to do my supply chain, I need to see how to do, how to take back and refurbish things or repair things. It completely changes the business model. But we have experiences that these digitally enabled business models are very profitable and very green. So how do we help? What kind of skills we need in place? What kind of marriage brokers we need? And I give you two pointers. One is the European Digital Innovation Hubs. I'm looking into over 150 regional innovation hubs are intending to do something for green. Their business is to digitalize the ecosystem in the region. 
they intend to use it for green. There we have a seed where your project can tag into. When you want a curricula, I developed with UN curricula development that I'm just putting in the chat. So I just press the button in the chat. And I can also give you a link to the European Innovation Hubs. So those are two pointers as a suggestion to the project. OK, but overall, my message is the two mega trends are not working together. So there's which is an opportunity for you to make a difference. And if you're really looking at a mass where really things have to happen, it's business and services and you know SME ecosystem, and they need to move to sustainability. And they need a huge skills themselves, but also with the you know support at the local level where that support can happen. And that's not only skills, it's finance, it's IT, it's many other things, but skills is key. Thank you, thank you, Elias. Uh, and and let me let me maybe uh, ease you a bit because uh, I I I can say that working together with the the most innovative SMEs in Europe, you said that indeed the circular economy is not uh, clearly a concept that that many have, but uh, we are aware that the landscape of SMEs is diverse in Europe. And, and as you said, it's through digital uh, as well innovation and through the innovators that are already in the European landscape that uh, we can we can uh, drive the uh, sustainability and the circular economy tackling that triple crisis uh, that yes. that's mentioned. Right? If you, so if you put, allow me uh, one point, yesterday sure. I'm in the team that develops digital product passport so it's the it tool to help businesses to try you know to transit to circular economy to make their product more sustainable and their business we had a yesterday a digital product passport webinar we had 2700 people online because this digitalization of business towards circular economy is catching wave so there's a huge interest but it will need a lot of IT infrastructures, but eventually skills to be able to work with such tools to do it, to actually do this sustainability switch. All right, and, and indeed, and indeed, uh, at the same time, we can indeed see this indication as a stimulus to use the opportunities that are in, in Europe to, to drive uh, uh, the, the sensibilities in the workforce uh, towards uh, a more sustainable um, uh, ecosystem. And in that respect, I would like to ask Francesca, how can environmental sustainability competences be combined with the digital skills so that we make sure that this awareness is living in the workforce and that it can contribute to the green and digital transition? Yes, uh, I think it's uh, very good that you point to uh, the term environmental sustainability competence rather than green skills. Uh, uh, when we hear a lot of discussions, there's always this, uh, maybe because it's a nice shortcut, maybe because it uh, uh, it looks fancy. Um, people talk about green skills as if these are completely different sets of skills that people need to acquire to contribute to the green transition. Uh, and that's actually not correct. I mean, what what we need are, uh, broadly speaking, uh, the same set of skills uh, that we have always needed, but uh, with some tweaks, uh, different combinations. But in particular, uh, the application of these skills uh, with the knowledge, but also attitudes uh, to achieve uh, sustainable goals. And this is why we talk about environmental sustainability competence. And it's not necessarily true that individuals with high levels of uh, uh, engineering skills or math skills or digital skills uh, will also want to contribute uh, and uh, care about environmental effects. And this is important for two reasons. One, when you talked about the Digital for Sustainability project more generally, uh, and uh, you know what kind of uh, modular approaches you can have, 
you know, if it's about the same set of skills, but recombined uh, in a different way, this opens many more opportunities uh, to empower a broader set of learners uh, to acquire the, 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 the right frame of mind, I would say, uh, to make a difference. Uh, it's not that you need to completely reshape uh, your, uh, your, your skill set. It's just that you need uh, to add specific bits and pieces. And uh, more generally, because it actually speaks about uh, the some of the opportunities in which uh, you can use digital to have uh, positive effects by thinking in a different way. Um, when uh, I mean, Elias has uh, talked about uh, circular economy, and uh, but at the very beginning, you know, when we think about digital and green, uh, we think about how the digital, the green, the environmental footprint of uh, uh, digital uh, um, infrastructure. Well. One of the things that we were looking at was, for example, how can you think about when you need to cool data centers, uh, you use uh, the heat that is generated, for example, to heat swimming pools. Uh, we were doing a project on how to enable kids to develop physical skills such as swimming. And this is a different way of thinking about, uh, about the problem. And finally, one example we had, we have looked at um, uh, job postings online uh, for uh, experts in the AI field, experts that are uh, engaged in the development maintenance uh, uh, of AI systems. So these are highly specialized uh, figures. So they are less than 1% of online vacancies. We looked at trends uh, in 14 OECD countries and it's less than 1% of overall vacancies. Even with ethics, what you see is that, and there is a big debate about ethical AI and trustworthy AI, less than 1% of these vacancies contain keywords uh, related to uh, ethics and etc. I bet that if we were to do the same exercise on, uh, for example, green environmental sustainability and etc. So how do you make the most of AI uh, profiles uh, to actually achieve environmental goals or make sure that these are compatible with the achievement of environmental goals? Figures would be fairly similar or even lower. So what we need is a rethink about how to combine uh, the two in the long run. Thank you so much, Francesca. And, uh, and I turn to you, Akim, to ask indeed how, how do we manage to combine this profiles and these skills that Francesca just mentioned? And how do we also make use of those intermediaries that you have uh, mentioned before and that also Elias has referred to, for example, when it comes to European Digital Innovation Hub. But I would like to add, uh, why not to use the potential of the most innovative part of European industry that is already familiar with the digital tools, with the digital solutions, and the us the skills to drive the uptake of skills into the workforce? And what can we learn from oh, the part for skill, the large scale partnership, and the digital? sustainability project that brings together such a variety of stakeholders in order to bring together, make structural change, bring together in a structural manner all these stakeholders, for instance, in the form of public-private partnership. Would this be a way forward and something that should become more structural to have systemic change? A lot of questions in one, and I'll try to be short. Um... First of all, let me revert to what Udias was saying because he mentioned at least two points that are very important to me. The one you also mentioned, the European Digital Innovation Hubs. For me, one of the most excellent examples of an initiative ever done because it combines the aspects we are discussing here with the proximity perspective also in a geographical way. And I know that one of your partners, for example, is a cluster initiative, but I think in Romania there might be others. This dimension is extremely important as they joint learning experience where you can have well-defined issues that are embedded in a social context where the public and the private side can come together to have this joint learning. This public-private thing is very important to me because we have discussed about that for ages, but when we talk about the two joint topics we are discussing here today, in my opinion, the private part needs to take 
the leadership. This is a demand driven exercise where basically the knowledge comes bottom up. And the whole set of digital technologies that we have, if you look at them, are actually driven in a decentralized way. No one has asked for uh, cryptocurrencies. No one has asked for AI to emerge, but basically the technical opportunities are there. And the driver of that is actually 4 billion gamers that we have in the world. The 4 billion gamers are the big source of innovation that we globally have. And whatever you hear about the metaverse, whatever you hear about digital payments and stuff, has been developed first in a very playful way from the generation that is right now in the education system and moving up in the education system. So basically, your target, which then basically brings me also to the point uh, of how to attract that target audience. And this is again through some of the mechanisms that basically we have uh, talked about before. When I, as an economist, went to university 10, 15 years ago and talk about economics, be that digital or not, I probably had four people in the audience forced by the professor to sit there. When you now talk about any of what we're talking about here today at any place, the audience is completely full. They don't want to stop after two hours. Uh, after the discussion, they come to you explaining to you what I programmed yesterday evening, what I'm doing here and there. These people take a massive interest in the practical, also economic application of digital and green use cases. And I give you two examples. The biggest bottleneck that, in my opinion, we have in terms of capital in Europe is the unused physical capital that is standing around. We have the traditional business model, and he has also alluded to that. Uh, that basically the supplier builds a machine, sells it to the buyer, and then good luck with the thing, and I'm out of this. In the future, we are much more going into the service economy by using machines to provide services. No one today basically needs a printing machine, but you can have a printing machine very usefully if you lease it for a couple of hours or days to do a project, same as a tractor, same as utility meters. Once this is digitized, you can see that with digital payments, with settling the insurance digitally, with having the bookkeeping in a digital way, that you have enormous efficiencies in the system that make the service economy much more attractive. But at the same time, it is free because you have not these underutilized things. You do not have the physical problem of moving all this stuff, this duplication of production and then standing around idly and doing nothing. But this addresses very clearly also uh, these issues here which I find a very important example. Last example, take the CO2 certificates or anything else that is green. And there I have a double role, I would say, for the intermediaries. Certain intermediaries are very useful. We discussed that. Others are a bit more dubious, in my opinion. We have these big CO2 schemes with the certificates and stuff like that. But now through digitalization, we also have the means that on platforms, Anyone here can directly link to anyone in Latin America, Africa. By the way, those countries are, uh, those areas are massively digitized and uh, tokenized uh, by now, much more than, than we are here. To directly link with the party where I would like to send some resources have the impact because the future in Web3 is not the transfer of money, it's not the transfer of any resources, it's the transfer of value and value is a subjective concept. So people will come to you, ask for how can you actually implement my project according to my principles, my preferences, my values. And in my opinion, the public sector is not primarily there to say that this shouldn't be your values, this shouldn't be what, what you want, but basically to enable it. So the public sector is turning into an enabler for business opportunities created both on the digital and green domain. And this is why I think the narrative, this is when we talk, that's my final remark, uh, what are really those skills? It's about being clear on the communication side of what I can want and what I can offer on being clear of what the fundamentals are. When we talk about all these digital things, uh, we are talking basically about code. We are talking about smart contracts. We are talking about things that 99% of people don't understand. But we're basically every line of code has an economic function, has a legal function, has the programming perspective, etc. where you need to have translators that are service providers that understand the demand, that see what is possible in terms of technology, and that can conceptualize that into a small feasible project on the basis of which you can up and rescale people. If you have that image in front of you, I think that you can embed in that image a lot of what we have been talking about today. And this is really something very concrete that all of you can work in your concrete environment for this initiative in the next four years. And then we have an endless amount of little tools where basically everyone can onboard just in their spare time or in their uh, business uh, time or whatever they have for two hours for a six-week uh, course, whatever you want in order to be worked.
Thank you so much, Yakim. I think I would like to enjoy uh, such a distinguished panel and uh, get an opportunity to challenge you with one last question, because you have mentioned them already to some extent, but I would like you to, to summarize and maybe list three skills and competencies that you deem fundamental for the twin transition, also to help our project partners to streamline and, and, and understand uh, uh, on, on which of those uh, the project uh, could focus on uh, uh, now that is kicking off. Uh, before you do that, I would like to also take the opportunity to ask uh, uh, if, if you want to prepare any question in the room to the audience and also to give the opportunity to our online participants uh, to uh, either type their question in the chat or raise their hand uh, once we kick off uh, the Q&A. And now really maybe one minute each, if you can list me those skills that we need. Shall we start back from you, Jackie? I'll be very short because I said most things. Uh, number one to me is language and making people understand each other. My experience says that uh, engineers don't speak proper language, that programmers basically have no social skills. I'm completely exaggerating. That lawyers and economists speak their own language uh, unless they are really in a team and are forced to work on a complete project trying to understand what that is, it will not work. So mix people together, bring them in very concise environments, focus on that they can actually communicate very clearly also to the outside world. That's a key issue. Second thing is don't rely on the traditional channels for gaining information. If you read the Financial Times, if you read the mainstream media, if you look at anything out there, you will get your standard information that you have. Nowadays, I get my information from blogs, I get my information from obscure chat rooms, I get my information from just going to companies and see what they are programming, so there needs to be a hand-on approach and you need to be efficient on your information collection. And the third thing, have the courage to listen to your audience, which is basically now that every 16, 17, 18 year old person is much more intelligent than I am in this business, being the leading person in this business here. And that is also sort of cultural change. Where basically, I cannot stand anymore in front of people telling me, telling them what to do. I need also to be able to learn from them what their concrete needs and interests are. And I don't need to share that, but I need to be able to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Deborah, do you want to give us your, your opinion? Yes, so I can't speak on uh, behalf of the consortium because we have not discussed it yet, but I really like the, what the Sanchez has said about this reshaping or reshaping existing skills that uh, will be have to be able just to, to just think differently and to apply their, their technical skills or vice versa to the, the system of transformation. And something else I wanted to say is that um, with this project, we really want to focus on these urgent skills for uh, to post as just transition. So for people who cannot uh, wait four years for uh, the tra traditional education system to adapt uh, to a labor market, uh, labor market is for people who are not going to pay attention to see who, uh, who uh, tell them what they need to do, uh, for instance, uh, with the sustainable reporting. So we need to, to shape this project for uh, work with uh, from different areas of our SMEs or people in need of new skills. Thank you, Deborah. Francesca, you have already enlightened us with, with very interesting insights. Your your take on the skills. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think on top of the issue of combining skills uh, uh, with the willingness uh, and the attitudes, uh, uh, one of the key skills that I think uh, is uh, uh, necessary to make the most uh, of other skills, uh, uh, in, uh, in part as has been said, is actually uh, the um, ability to solve problems collaboratively. And uh, there are different aspects to this. There is the how do groups make uh, uh, decisions uh, and how decisions can be facilitated. The other is how do you coordinate uh, different input when the information that different agents have uh, 
uh, is different. Uh, and finally, how do you solve conflict uh, and how do you produce uh, collectively uh, new information? And um, coming from the perspective of somebody that is very much engaged uh, in skills assessments uh, in an international perspective, most of you probably know what the PISA study is and how we test, uh, you know, reading, math, science or literacy or numeracy. Uh, a key challenge is actually to define some of these uh, uh, less standard skills like the ability to collaborate, uh, to define different levels of proficiency and that actually then embed this in the context of curricula first, uh, but then also in hiring decisions. Uh, how do you discriminate uh, who is good at this and who's not? And then what kind of trade-offs uh, do you make uh, when you're hiring people based on on the different skill sets uh, that you have. We all talk about the importance of these transversal skills. These are extremely important uh, and they're not soft skills as people say, but really defining uh, the underpinning uh, uh, attitudinal and cognitive capacities is not necessarily obvious. Thank you, Francesca. And Elias, you have already hinted uh, some clear solutions for the way forward. Your take now on, on the skills needed. Yes, I, I mean, most of it has been said, but I take the opportunity to to make it a little bit. Uh, I will show it on one slide again, but uh, sorry with this. I want to give you the bigger picture because how do you teach people what sustainability means? Uh, I don't know if it did you display. No, not yet. No. There is a so. Of course, you can say everybody should know the basic of LCA, life cycle analysis. Everybody should know the basic what circular economy is. So you could say embed it in everybody's engineering, IT, you know, uh, whatever business uh, management schools. Insert some of the basics of what environmental sustainability means. Still nothing. No. We can see. We can see. Oh, you can see it. Okay. So you can see that the challenge is to understand this trade-off that the skills to get a good job should be the same as the skills to get environmental sustainability upskilling. Those two are the same because normally people think green skilling is on top of or something separate from getting a good job. So we should get the basics. I mean, I'm pleading for one thing. Start thinking of the world in the three dimensions. It has to go for economy, it has to be good for people, social, and fair. What that means in my business in daily life, because now I'm too old to go to school. When you say, well, this is good for your business, but if you do that, it's good for business and environment. And by the way, and some social issue. So instead of kind of soliciting very kind of narrow things, the bigger picture is think 3D. Now, how do you optimize in the 3D? Nobody knows. This is the ultimate frontier because we have been tailored to optimize GDP. We care only, and digitalization cared for 30 years out only about one dimension, economic, efficiency gain, GDP growth. They couldn't care less about social environmental sustainability. We slowly growing to realize that there are three dimensions. We struggled with social for many years now, maybe five, 10 years. We're trying to see about inequalities we create and, and gender and skills and access to digitalization. So we do have these indicators. Environment is completely new thing for digital world. So thank you. what thank I would see is the 3D vision. Thank you very much, Elias, for bringing this actually big picture uh, to, to actually conclude our discussion. I would still like to see whether in the room there is anyone with uh, some questions to our panelists. One question, yeah. No, it's not so much of a question, but it's maybe a call to action. I mean, this was very interesting discussion, and thank you very much for bringing such uh, distinguished guests. Um, 
I would uh, like, like you are in said that, yeah, we, we are gathering information from different channels. And first of all, I would like to ask if this panelist would stay around for four years and maybe give us, uh, you know, some insights now and then. And secondly, it's maybe for the project coordinator to give us the space um, to post uh, some of the uh, interesting articles and interesting blogs to really be on top of uh, this topic. Because in Slovenia, uh, with this project, we will turn around a lot of hats and a lot of interest will be, will be, uh, will be, uh, we will get a lot of interest. So I would really like to be on top of, not on top of everything, but you know, just be uh, in the loop of the information. Absolutely. Thank you for this suggestion. I'm sure there is plenty of room to continue to work together, and I hope our excellent panelists uh, will not mind to not to get rid of us. So we can we can definitely keep in touch uh, over the years. Uh, another look to see whether there is another question. And then question. And it's very interesting to what the panelists think. Um, what we want to do, we want to. SMEs to take action. And for them to take action, they have to be motivated. So what would be the one recommendation they have for us on this consortium to motivate SMEs? So I don't know if you could hear it online, but I'm repeating just in case. Uh, if you could give us uh, your insights on how to motivate the SMEs, how this consortium of partners can motivate the SMEs to get on board with the right skills. Please, I have to ask you for one minute each, uh, if you want, or unless there is a volunteer who wants to take it, uh, because we are closing down this session, and this uh, meeting is continuing only with the partners uh, of the project. So we'd love to ask the general public to, to leave the room afterwards. Who wants to take this question? You are keen first? I can start. Uh, first, to the first uh, remark, uh, we will be around, uh, maybe even more than you want, but uh, we are interested in, <laughs> in results, so very happy to cooperate. On that question, as I have worked on uh, SME policy for 10 years, uh, my advice would be, and that's very obvious, for SMEs to know actually what their environment is, what their own ecosystem is, what their basis is. And the nice thing about digitalization is that even as a very small company, Digitally, you can have a very big outreach. So in the past, we had local communities. We had uh, the physical factor playing a role to create trustworthy environments. Interestingly enough, when we talk about all this advanced stuff, for example, in the field of finance, digital finance, etc., it all emerged after the financial crisis 2007, 2008, through alternative financing, crowdfunding, crowd innovation, crowdsourcing, in a very concrete environment. When you needed a 10,000 euro loan from your bank and didn't get it, and then you asked your customers around you that cared about you to get that social dimension indeed into that. What would happen to the village if the bakery closes? Stuff like that. That is your home base. And this for me is the starting point for the SMEs to get motivated because normally an SME is socially embedded into a context where for them it matters that they are reliable. It matters that their vision on something is shared by other people because that is what really motivates them. That's a huge difference between the big techs and the SMEs where the big techs say, go to hell, we take your data. And the SMEs normally, as the very small companies say, then I started with a purpose, I want to do that my way. And it's actually not primarily financial what I'm doing. Of course, they have to survive specifically with COVID and all these things. But normally, if you ask SMEs, they do not start with finance, they start with their mission. And if you make them identify that vision and also have the customer relation, you immediately get these dimensions we are discussing into that for the term of motivation. The more you take their interest out of their hand and give that to intermediaries, the more you lose that. And that is what unfortunately we've done so long in finance, where we have taken out the opportunity for you and me to actually finance your bank or your local shop, because then the banks and intermediaries are doing that or others are doing that, but they have their own interest. They don't care about that. So the huge thing is, and that's what all of us are saying, is basically create a sort of service-oriented platform economy where your social environment is the driver according to your needs and where you can regain the control 
on the various activities that you have there in order to continue with the motivation. If you achieve that, that for me is the biggest driver of the motivators. Thank you, Joachim. Any reaction or addition to Francesca or Elias? No, that's okay. I, what I would just add is that you get SMEs if you tell them the skills that I'm trying to you know, reach you for are good for your business. You don't need to tell them, yeah, I'll just make you green. Of course, the green is part of what also their cons consumers want. So if those skills will actually make their business better and more sustainable, consumers will like that as well. Thank you so much, Ilias. I can also add uh, from the perspective of uh, having worked with Ninja SME for several years, I think it's also an important question as leader of communications is how you put things. So SMEs, they need to have a very clear uh, vision of what is the benefit, what they will get out of it, and we need to get rid of product jargon or even policy jargon. So SMEs do not care about the green deal or the fit for 55 package. We really need to tell them exactly what they will get out of these trainings and how it will deliver them. Thank you so much, Deborah, for this uh, very clear words. And uh, before I, I uh, ask you to join me in thanking the panelists, uh, again, I would like to ask the project the partners to stay in the room uh, and the public uh, to maybe continue discussion uh, over over a coffee outside. And the same for those who are joining us online. Now, please join me in thanking this excellent panel. Thank you so much.